wonder. It was a kind of throwback for me to uh, my childhood when I asked this very same question my grandmother. My grandmother uh, had grown up in a bourgeois Prussian household where Plato was read in the evening and she had then studied in Freiburg uh, with Heidegger in a graduate seminar on Plato. And so she answered, um, knowledge comes from Thaumatze, from the sense of wonder, staunen in German. So it's intellectual curiosity, the being uh, astonished by things that leads us on the path of knowledge. I want to explore this relationship between wonder and knowledge through the readings and canticles that we have been singing and hearing tonight. They have been chosen for the time of Candlemas, uh, exploring, uh, circulating around the theme of light, enlightenment, illumination. And I've brought you an illumination to look at while I'm speaking. So, um, the New Testament reading that uh, Tim Powell read for us is um, one that is very familiar in its setting to all choir members because we will sing actually the canticle of Simeon uh, every week in Evensong and it's also sung in Compline and originally we had planned to have a Compline for Candlemas of the 2nd of February down in the crypt. This isn't possible, but fortunately uh, we were able to explore the canticle setting that um, Alex and I sang tonight uh, earlier in a workshop based on the Bodleian manuscript from which we also sang tonight. And there will be another workshop on that on the 16th of February. Um, so we had um, the reading tonight in two parts. First, the uh, scriptural reading and then the singing out. And actually, whenever I get confused which comes first in the order of Evensong, the readings or the canticles, um, I mentally go back to the sequence of Candlemas as a mnemonic help. First comes the narrative, then we are allowed to burst into song. This would also have been the case for the nuns of Medin, whose setting of the Song of Simeon we sang tonight. They were sitting upstairs on the nuns' gallery, watching the provost and the clergy doing the reading while being themselves invisible. So, uh, like you now on Zoom, being able uh, to watch and sing along uh, while um, we have only ourselves, um, uh, can only see ourselves uh, here, uh, down there. Um, so, um, we would be the equivalent of the east end of the meeting parish church while you are uh, the collective of nuns sitting upstairs at the west end. When the nuns were writing out the order of service for the provost, they reserved the special numbers for themselves, among them a candlemas version of the nunc dimittis, based on their Cistercian tradition. In it, the last line of the song is highlighted as the most important, the Lumen ad Revelazione Gentium. It is extracted as a repetitio, a refrain that precedes as an antiphon and closes the canticle and is sung in between as a meditation on the whole song. This. And this line, Lumen ad Revelazione Gentium, is normally rendered in the English setting that we are singing as a light to lighten the Gentiles. But that's not the full meaning of uh, this original line in Greek or also in the Latin that the nuns would have uh, been singing. So, revelatio, at revelationem, to reveal um, the uh, light to the Gentiles. So, uh, this revelation it's much, is much stronger than just to lighten. And literally, revelatio is the lifting of the velo, the veil. We can think of the veil of ignorance, such as highlighted by the annual Geddes lecture for investigative journalism at St. Edmund Hall, which is coming up. The meeting nuns took 
revelatio both in a more literal and in a more spiritual way. I don't know whether you had a chance to look at the manuscript image, which is on the front of the Orthodox service. Um, if you want, um, uh, Zach has kindly put the file uh, with an image in the, the chat function of Zoom, so that you can look it up. It's um, a page from a Psalter written by the choir mistress of Needing, Margarete Hoppes, a kind of counterpart in the 16th century to James Whitbourne, somebody who had to control the novices and prevent their singing from dragging and from going flat. So we have lots of instructions of um, uh, preserved for her, which she would use in school of um, how to get uh, uh, singers to sing in time and uh, James directed this just at the rehearsal and beforehand um, via evil presence of Zoom of speeding up, up again in the song. So um, Margarita Hawkins added a number of elements to the start of the psalm, the Lord is my light and my salvation. She wrote the notes for the start of the antiphon of the top of the page, that's outside the detail on the service sheet, but visible in the double spread sent round via ticket news. And she illustrated, and the medieval term for that is to illuminate it, um, the initial D for Dominus Illuminatio Mea with a scene which makes visible the Christian interpretation of this psalm verse. And she also stitched in a veil. You can see just a uh, um, uh, seam line of it on the illustration of the service sheet, uh, just above the stitches. The pragmatic reason for stitching in a veil is to protect the gold of the initial from rubbing off when the book is repeatedly opened and shut and touches the parchment of the opposite side. And Margarita would have opened and shut her psalter multiple times every day. So this is the go-to book which she would hold in her hand um, every uh, day, at least uh, during the Divine Office. But using a piece of uh, the cloth that also marked her own religious identity, because it's the same type of cloth that would have been used to veiling herself, um, so her identity as an enclosed nun goes beyond this pragmatic purpose. It stages the revelatio, the revelation of which the nun Dimitris sings. Inside the initial, you see literally the embodiment of knowledge. The newborn Christ, as the word of God, lies naked on the floor, the very image of vulnerability and loneliness. From him, the light radiates into the thickly applied gold, spreading across the scene with Mary, the angels and the animals soaking in the light and spreading further via the gold letter D into the text. As soon as Margarita Hoppes lifted the veil, she became part of this transmission of light from Christ via the word of the psalm to her as the singer, adopting in the first person the words of the psalmist, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Is there anything that can frighten me any longer? Not a bad university model for Oxford. The psalm is also linked closely to Mary, whom we see twice on this page. Um, at the nativity scene in the initial and at the bottom of the page, which shows in miniature the Annunciation with Mary accepting the great greeting of the angel with the words, I am the handmaid of the Lord. This links to the other canticle we were singing tonight, the Magnificat, where Mary sings of the wonder that in Christ's birth everything is turned upside down. The hungry are filled with good things and the meek are exalted. We were singing this in Luther's translation, um, Meine Seele erhebt den Herrn, and in the setting he chose for it, the Tonus Peregrinus. This name, Pilgrim's Tone, refers to the fact that this is the only psalm tone which ends on a different note and mode than it starts. It had been used by the nuns in meeting for special Marian feasts such as Candlemas. 
Luther insists on using it for everything of the Magnificat, precisely to highlight the sense of wonder. Being open to wonder without a preconceived answer in the imagination of the hearts can lead to strange and enlightening things. So you might up, uh, end up somewhere else from where you started and you don't always know where this path of knowledge will lead you, but it uh, affords you a new side of things, precisely what knowledge should be about. I would like to end the exploration of the relationship of wonder and knowledge with two further concepts. If knowledge is based on wonder, enlightened by Christ as the world, as the word, Christ as the word, it leads to a double sensation, humility and hope. Humility in realizing that all our knowledge is partial and provisional and needs a guiding light. This should prevent us from falling for supposedly easy solutions, fake news and false promises. It also releases something more lasting, the hope that if we persevere with questioning, doubting, lifting the veil, searching for the light, there is hope. Hope for an increase in knowledge, for moving slightly further to the truth, to rise and shine, for our light has come. Hope is also the topic of next week's sermon, which the chapel will be um, delivering, addressing how wonder and hope relate to each other. So I won't dwell any longer on this, but want to end by quoting a very short German poem, which Berlin Brücke, the abbess of Mariensee, another of the northern German convents, has chosen as motto for this year's message from the Abbey. It is by the German Jewish poet Hilde Domi. I'll read it first in German and then try an English translation. Nicht müde werden, sondern dem Wunder leise, wie einem Vogel die Hand hinhalten. Not to grow tired, but quietly, like for a bird,